<laughs> no, I fully expect you to troll me the whole time, so. Okay. So are we ready to go? Yeah. All right. All right. Speaker Scott from, uh, Scott Thomas from Detroit, and uh, I hope you're here for the Beating the InfoSec Learning Curve. I want to make sure that you visit our sponsors. Um, and also, uh, I teach here at Lipscomb. I just appreciate everybody coming uh, down to our small campus, and I hope you have a really good time while you're down here, uh, especially tonight. So, Scott. Thanks. So like you said, this is beating the InfoSec learning curve without burning out. Um, one of the things that I have a passion for is learning, learning anything, be it InfoSec or other things. So I decided that I was going to put together this uh, talk to basically get people to understand that you, know, you can learn a lot of different things in InfoSec. You, a lot of people think, oh, InfoSec is hackers and that's it. And there's so many different jobs that are in this industry that uh, gives a lot of you know, ability to kind of branch out into different things. So. Uh, Give you an idea of who I am, where I work, things like that. I'm also known as Secure Holio on pretty much all the different uh, social media sites, things like that. Been in IT since about 98. I've done a number of different um, jobs, be it network administration or help desk, or um, worked as an ID admin for a while, which is technically part of security. Been in security since about 2006, basically because I didn't like the help desk anymore and I wanted to get out of there. And it seemed like a, a good way to move. Um, so it was something I said, you know, security seemed like the people that knew everything. I wanted to, you know, try and see what they were about. So that, that's when I moved over to the, uh, the ID admin job. Currently, I'm a senior security consultant at Viopoint. It's a security consulting firm in Michigan. Um, I've got my website up there and my email if you uh, care to contact me in that. So um, the other thing is this slide and the who I'm not slides are the only ones that have, uh, that have bullets on them, like Jack Daniel pointed out this morning. Bullets are going to kill your presentation if you're trying to present information to somebody. Bullets are just too much stuff to read on a slide. Um, also, I would suggest if you guys haven't watched the video by Melissa Marshall, uh, it's a TED Talk about giving presentations for uh, technical presentations for non-technical people. It's a great talk to listen to. And it's about four minutes long. So, so who I'm not? I'm not a psych major. Some of this uh, information in here I did pull from different psychology sites or uh, studies, things like that, about the burnout aspect of it. Um, I'm also not a recruiter like Eve is, so she had a different view of this than I do because I'm, you know, somebody that's tried to go through this stuff and tried to figure out how I need to learn and do my job. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody that knows me knows I'm not perfect. Uh, I don't claim to be. I'm also not a career coach, but. I do date one, and she actually helped me with some of the, the information that she's seen on her side of it from trying to help people find jobs and uh, basically trying to get the information that they need to do their job. So I wanted to do a couple things. This thing's really hot. Um, do a couple ID, like uh, starting off slides. First thing is first is we're all just people. Everybody in this conference is just another person like you are. So if you want to learn something, if you want somebody to talk to, if you think, well, that person knows this information, I want to find out that, go up and talk to them. They're a person just like you are. They got up this morning. They had breakfast. They came to the conference just like you. They have an interest in being here just like you have an interest in being here. So you would want, you just be yourself and walk up and talk to people. Um, like I said, we're all just people, except for the dogs, even though they do think they're people. And another friend of mine, Ben Ten, brought this up on Twitter. Um, not sure if anybody can read that actually. Basically, it's a uh, a comic that he wrote about talking to people in the industry, and it starts out that the the guy on the right saying, you know, hey, that's some awesome hacker, go say hi, and his brain is telling him, you know, oh, this is somebody you need to talk to, and he's like, no, 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 I don't want to talk to him. And he goes up to him, hey, how about those those SSL bleeds, right? And then the hacker walks away. So just something to you know to think about. Everybody's the same. Everybody's you know should be approachable, and if they're not, they're not worth your time. So if you're trying to learn and get into InfoSec, I always thought the here be dragons type uh, idea was something that hit home with me per se, just because of the fact that when you think about the maps back in the day and the cartographers that created the maps, whenever there was something that people didn't know or people didn't have an idea of what was in that area, they drew a dragon or they drew a sea monster or things like that, and they were like, this is a dangerous area and you shouldn't go there. I think InfoSec is kind of the same way. It's the unknown. You get the people that 
they know that there are certain things that they can break. They know that it wasn't designed to do a certain thing, but they want to learn how it can be changed and how it can be uh, circumvented. I've also added dragons to what I feel that are each of the important points of my talk. <clears throat> so a little bit about getting into InfoSec and where you are coming from. Um, a lot of people don't come from IT backgrounds. Um, like Eve came from you know, linguistics and things like that in the morning. I came into IT wanting to be a history teacher originally and kind of fell into IT. It wasn't something I had a passion for originally. I've known people that were in psychology majors, people that were mechanical engineers. You know, It really doesn't matter where you came from trying to get into informa information security. You can find what you need to know by learning. So as an example, maybe you came from law enforcement and you said, well, you can't arrest people for not using a secure password. You can't arrest people for not encrypting their data, although we would like to sometimes. Um, but you, you have to ask yourself, you're like, well, what can I offer for a job in information security? What can I bring to the table? I talked to a person this morning that they were in construction before they came into IT. Completely separate. I mean, they had nothing to do with each other, but they came in and they're at a security conference now. So it's something that everybody can, you know, can come from any different area and, uh, and offer something. So if you're coming from, you know, law enforcement, let's say, you might be able to say, okay, well, I can offer physical security. Physical security is a domain for security just like any other. Um, it does have a lot of crossover, so you're going to have your incident response or you know things like that that you would be able to offer from that perspective from your background. Maybe you came as an, uh, an accountant and you say, okay, well, I've got you know lots of numbers I deal with. I have you know exact counts. Why is this number one off? Things like that. I actually had a little bit of my OCD that shows through on that when I was younger. My mom always told me I had to balance my checkbook. I would spend hours if I was a nickel off trying to figure out where I was missing that nickel. So there's actually a story of, uh, I don't know if anybody's read it, called The Cuckoo's Egg. And it was a story about a person who was an accountant that was tasked to try and find why there's a 75 cent error on the computer usage back in, you know, when people charge for computer time. That 75 cent error turned out to be uh, someone who hacked in and was using the system for, I think it was nine minutes or something like that. And that was, you know, enough that the 75 cents led them to finding out someone who was hacking into their system. So, you know, you can bring things from other industries as well. And I think if you're, an, you know, if you're an accountant, maybe you're bringing your attention to detail. People need metrics. People need, you know, attention to detail for SIM, be, you know, incident response, things like that. That attention to detail is really going to help you out. Maybe you're a teacher. You know, we need teachers. Horribly bad need teachers. Um, lots of people can do and there's a lot of people in the industry that are very good at some things, whatever it may be. But they're not necessarily good at teaching those same things. They may be able to, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit uh, later as far as from my perspective, I can do a lot of things, but I, not, I can't necessarily teach someone exactly why I know something. So that ability to teach is something huge for our industry, and there, there's a fallacy out there of those who can't do teach, which I think is complete and utter BS. Um, it's hard to teach somebody and I'm, like I said, I'm not good at it. I just kind of give the information out there and hope somebody is able to catch on to it. Um, you'll see a little bit later in uh, one of my slides, I've got a picture of my website that I've got up there. And in the corner, it says Security War Wizard. If you guys have ever uh, read uh, Terry Goodkind, he wrote a, a book called The Sword of Truth series. And in that series is a character who's a war wizard. He can't be taught how to use magic. It just comes intuitively to him whenever he needs it. And I kind of get that feeling from my perspective of, I took the CISSP exam. I can't name the 10 domains off the top of my head. I, if I need something that I, from my knowledge, I can talk about it, but I, it's not something I can just spout off on. So um, if you're really good at teaching and you know InfoSec, then that's a bonus that we definitely need in the industry. And coincidentally, um, my manager will only hire people that have some sort of an ability to teach, be it, you know, in the InfoSec or not, be it, you know, maybe they teach martial arts, but the ability to show somebody else what you know or at least be able to slightly explain it is something that he values really highly. Some people did come from IT. Maybe you say, oh, I'm a firewall jockey and I, you know, I don't know security, but I had the same issue when I was moving from my last company to the company I'm at now. When I was trying to figure out how can I get out of that company and get into a better job, I was kind of defeating myself saying, well, I only know my old company's technology. I only know how that stuff works. 
And you know, so you get to the, where you don't think that you know enough information, and so you're, you kind of uh, almost stagnate yourself in your current job. I think, though, that if you come from technology, you can have a lot of problem-solving skills. So maybe something doesn't work right. Maybe the server went down, and you know why it went down. That's something that's huge in the industry because you should be able to help the people that are breaking it at that point determine why it was broken and how to defend against it. So maybe you work with the build, you know, the uh, if you're a builder or an infrastructure person, you work with the breakers to try and understand why it broke and how to get uh, to work it with it better. Maybe you worked in a service industry, or you know, you're a mechanic or a barista or something like that, and you go home and you work with technology, and you know, you're like, well, what can I bring to that infosec side of things? Customer service is a huge thing as well. You're going to end up having to talk to the business, having to talk to people, and tell them things that maybe they're not going to want to hear. And that ability to be polite and be you know, uh, respectful to that person you're talking to is going to be a, a definite benefit for, uh, to you. So if after all that you decide, yeah, I still want to get into information security, that's great because we have a lot of jobs. No, really. We have a lot of jobs. That was about... 20 different titles, I think, created that slide, and that's not all of them. So you're going to end up with a lot of different jobs that maybe don't even have anything to do with one another. Maybe it's something where, you know, you're just starting out and you're an ID administrator like I was. Maybe you've worked in IT for a number of years and you're going to go into firewall administration or, you know, maybe you want to try pen testing. It's just there's so many different jobs to do that you're never going to, you know, tire of of different things to try. <clears throat> and that brings me up to kind of the, the first part of this, uh, this talk is there's so many different jobs in InfoSec, there's a lot of different paths you can take. So, and this comes up to the audience participation part. So when somebody says, I'm a doctor, what's the first question you ask them? Exactly, what kind of doctor are you? Oh, I'm a surgeon. Okay, so I'm a brain surgeon. And you can keep going down this, and you maybe you get somebody that says, well, I'm a minimally invasive endonasal endoscopic surgeon. That gets pretty defined. And you start to think, oh, okay, that's someone who goes through the nasal cavity to do brain surgery. That's you know, a pretty specialized skill. InfoSec goes the same way, but when you, someone asks you, well, I work in InfoSec, what's the next question you ask them? Most people are going to say, do you get to carry a gun? <laughs> That people think physical security a lot of times is the only security they know. So our industry hasn't gotten to the point that it's widespread enough that people realize that there's so many different jobs you can do. So let's suggest some ground rules. And this is one of the dragons that I put up there. Um, and Eve will probably back me up on this. That should not be your resume if you're starting on information security. So many people want to put every word they've ever heard of in technology on their resume. It's great to learn, it's great to know stuff, but you shouldn't be throwing every word that you've ever heard out there. So I mentioned this is my website. It's run on CentOS minimum on a DMZ in my desk, uh, off of my network at home. Um, it's, you know, I manually created IP tables for it. I run S it's, uh, encrypted SSH. None of that goes on my resume. I never, you know, I'll never claim I know CentOS. I'll never claim that you know, I know how to run a website. That's not something that I'm good at. That's not something I'm going to put on my resume for you know, recruiters to contact me about and say, hey, I've seen keyword like Eve's talk this morning. I don't want them contacting me on that because I don't know it. You want to tailor your resume to what you're actually looking for. And speaking of applying for jobs, anybody here like spam? Well, other than Belt, who decides that he likes to play around with it. Um, nobody likes spam, so don't send your resume out to every job that you're, you're seeing in the security realm. Figure out what kind of jobs you're looking for and tailor your, your learning and your job search to the same one. So with all that said, you decide that you are going to switch careers. Maybe you're like, okay, yeah, this InfoSec thing seems kind of cool. I'm going to try it out and see what happens. Think you can make the leap? You have new work, new things to learn. How do you do it and can you do it? Um, Basically, you have to start thinking about, is this a small shift in my job title? Is this something I've been doing for years? Is this something completely different than what I've ever done? And you have to figure out if the industry is right for you also, or if you, you end up confused like the dog. I had to put more dogs in the slide, so. My, my slide to dog ratio was too low, so. Um, does it, anybody know how you would know if you're in the right industry and if it's a good fit for you? Okay. What, what would teach you that you were liking it? 
Okay. My thing is, is that if you're learning. So if you are learning and you want and more, you, you voraciously just trying to find out more information about something because it's your passion, because it's something you're interested in, you're definitely in the right field. That's your, your career as well. So once you, once you do decide, okay, yeah, I'm in the right industry, I'm going to start learning, where do you figure out how to focus? Where are you going to spend your time? Everybody knows what a learning curve is, right? So this is the ideal learning curve. So X number of you know, time units gets X number of widgets learning or whatever you want to tag to it, be it new subjects or you know, more information on the same subject, whatever. But it's never this perfect. You never get a perfect slant of I put in this much time, I get this much learning from it. A lot more common, you end up with, you know, you put in a, a little bit of time right off the bat and you learn a whole bunch because it's a lot of entry level knowledge. And you kind of level off a little bit as you keep, you know, you keep putting more time into it. Maybe you become an expert in that field and you learn, you know, tips and tricks and things like that. But as you go along, you also end up with things like deadlines and, you know, other uh, jobs and things that you're going to end up learning that are going to take your time as well. Another type is the epiphany curve, uh, which is kind of like that aha moment. You spend a whole lot of time going through something, you're starting to go through and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm lear learning some stuff, but I'm really not catching on yet. Then you have that moment where everything all clicks, it all makes sense, and you learn a whole just mess of stuff right at once. Um, the one thing that I would like uh, to bring up, though, oops, did I go too far? I went too far. So why do you want to learn? That's the question you have to start asking yourself. Is this something that you want to get in, into InfoSec because you want to break things, or you want to defend things, or you just want to make more money, or you know, maybe just like I am, I love learning new things. So even if it's something I have in complete disinterest in from a job perspective, I'll go Google something I don't know. So you have to you know, kind of figure out what's the, what's the reason that you're coming into this industry and why do you want to be here. Once you do, you say, okay, well, I need to learn. Where do I go to learn? You know, do I go to higher education? Do I go to the certification route? Do I just try and get some uh, job experience and you know, go through things that way? And none of your information that you learn is ever wasted. So if you go to a class and you say, why am I here? Why am I doing this? It, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Personally, I think it's never wasted. Even if you're in a class that you know, you know everything, you're still going to have something that you're going to learn. So if you do decide to go the higher ed route, um, go get your diploma or that. And maybe it's something where, you know, and you brought this up earlier today, is something like such and such job says master's degree required. Well, do you really need the master's degree or is it something that's, you know, flexible? If it is something that's required, yeah, okay, fine, go get it. But it's not something that you want to take lightly, though, either. That's thousands of dollars you're spending on an education. And actually, uh, one of the things that my manager brought up when I went through uh, this information with him was is that he saw his college as $90,000 worth of a really expensive networking opportunity. So it's something where you're going to get a lot of your connections that way, but you're not going to necessarily learn the stuff that you need for your job going forward. You're going to, but the other thing to think about, though, is some of these classes that you're going to take at your, at your, uh, your university are going to be things you're never going to learn outside of there. If you would decide, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to be, you know, a pen tester, you may learn some stuff in technical side in your college education. But the things that you're not going to learn on your own usually are technical writing. You're not going to learn how to talk to the business and things like that. the soft skills that uh, you are going to need once you go to write reports and things like that. You may learn in your college education versus the the really hardcore technical stuff like, you know, tearing apart a, a specific you know module of code or something like that. On the certification side, everybody calls it alphabet soup, and it's true. Um, you get a number of acronyms behind your name. What does it mean? I have to look up half of them most of the time. I mean, there's so many of them out there. You never know if the value is there. You never know if they're going to be accepted. Some of them are, you know, like the CISSP are required for government jobs. Does it mean that you need it? Do you want to work for the government or not? It's all a personal thing if you want to spend the time learning that. Um, basically, my suggestion on certifications is to talk to people in the industry. Uh, Eve brought up a thing this morning about the OSCP. OSCP, I have not taken it, but from what I've heard, is a incredibly, incredibly hard certification. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I've taken the CISSP. Eh. <laughs> 
I, I took it on three hours of sleep and I had gone out the night before and I still passed. So I can't say it's, you know, all that difficult. But finding out from people in the industry and talking to them and trying to figure out is this certification worth it is well worth your time before you spend the time trying to go through the certification itself. Maybe it's all about the experience. You're saying, okay, can I get there, you know, that way? Can I prove that I can do this hands on? Maybe it's something where, you know, if I get job experience, I don't need the education. I don't need the certifications. I think both sides matter. I think you can get the education and the certifications and get the job experience. Then you don't have to worry about either side. And it's also important to realize nobody, uh, everybody learns different. Nobody's the same when you go to, you know, start learning. Maybe somebody likes reading. You know, maybe you've got a, you've taken speed reading classes and you've got a 98% comprehension and perfect recall. Well, <laughs> But if that's your thing, there's there's still people that are making books. I mean, Jason has, has one that's coming out shortly. George has got a book out. There, people are still writing books. So if it's something that that's how you learn, go for it. Do your reading. Do do what you can learn from. So you also probably would want to meet my manager, Wolfgang Gorlick. He, <laughs> I think you're the only one that can get away with hugging him. Um, you never see him without his phone. He's forever reading. He's always reading, you know, like RSS feeds, Twitter, something. He's always got his, his nose in his phone trying to learn more. He also wrote an RSS feed. And this is something to remember. If you guys are, are readers, just the, the people that, the feeds that he follows in his RSS stream, he wrote a script to parse it all out and figure out how much data was coming in on a daily basis. Every one day was four days worth of content at his read speed. And he's taking speed reading courses. So if you're a reader and you like to read, that's fine. Just know that you have to spend your time somewhere because there is that much information out there. I can also only figure that his study looks something like that. Um, he keeps he says he reads oh, about 20 books a, uh, a month and about 300 articles a month. He also has a three-hour commute and he learn, listens to a lot of audio books. So. Uh. Um, I tend to, to learn more about uh, things that I enjoy as, as far as YouTube or uh, security tube. Um, I you know grab some food, grab a beer or whatever, and I have a seat and you know watch a video on whatever. If you go into security tube and type in the word intro, there's over 200 videos just on intro to something. So it's another option to put out there. There's over 10,000 videos on security tube. So it's a huge resource for everybody. Um, at one point, I, I had some talks on there. And they got pulled. I don't know why. So, also a good thing that you know when you go to look on learn on the internet, you never know who's going to be teaching you. It might be me, or maybe you're the more the hands-on type. You're like, hey, where's my solder gun? I need to do something. I need to to feel something in my hands. I need to be able to touch it and understand it and break it down. Then you're probably going to be friends with Belt. Say hi, Belt. <laughs> it, trolling goes both ways. Um, so my friend Mark back there is a coworker of mine. Uh, he also goes by Beltface. He likes to tinker. No, he really likes to tinker. Like he automated his apartment with Raspberry Pis that control lights and his Nest thermostat and his alarm and a whole mess, whole mess of other stuff. So he really likes to play around with stuff. One of the things we got at the office was the Pony Express. A lot of people have probably heard about that. It's a four thousand dollars security appliance. Belt's first thought on it. Let me take it apart. We haven't even used it yet. <laughs> yeah, our pen test lead was not happy with that one. <laughs> so, other considerations that you can think about is, are you the smartest person in the room? If you are, you're in the wrong room. And I really believe that. When I go to interview somebody, if I ask them a question and they don't know it, I'd rather hear, I don't know, but I'll find out, or oh, I don't know, or I can look it up, or I don't know, but I can learn it. I don't want somebody with all the answers because that means that they're, they think they know everything. This is one of the things that I fail at a lot. Even people you dislike can teach you something. There was an issue where I had a person I disliked at a previous conference, and they were given a talk, and I didn't. I was like, no, I'm not going to go see that talk. I don't like that person, you know, and I fell into my own trap. I 
I was like, I can't learn from this one. This, I'm just not going to go. And the talk actually was a, a pretty decent talk. Thankfully, there was a video of it afterwards. But this is something I work on on a daily basis as well. Even people you dislike can teach you something. So when you say, I need to, and this is totally a CISSP rip. It's, you know, mile wide and inch deep. Um, you have to start somewhere. You have to say, okay, where, what am I passionate about? Am I passionate about breaking things? Am I passionate about defending things? Maybe I want to help the businesses be more secure, whatever it may be. You need to try everything. Find out what makes you passionate. Start learning a little bit about everything. A lot of what people end up with with security jobs is they're the one or two people in security in their entire company. So everyone looks to them as the security expert. And they may not know things like maybe they're not a coder. Maybe they don't know pen testing, but they're really good at firewalls. I mean, it's all relative to what you're passionate about and what you're good at. So keep, you know, try different things. Try coding. Try pen testing. Try writing policies. Try everything and see what, you have, what you're good at and what you want to do. And the biggest help for all that is the people sitting around you. So everyone has something that they can contribute to the community, be it life experiences, be it knowledge that they've gained through trial and error, whatever it may be. Maybe you're, you know, an OSX god and you know how to do X, Y, Z, and it's nobody even knows on, you know, there's all these posts on uh, forums and nobody knows how to fix it, but you do. That's what you need to share with people. That's what you need to tell everyone, hey, you know, I can do this. I can show you how to, you know, fix that issue. So one of the things that I would like to do right now is have everybody, and this is like fourth grade, turn around, say hi, meet somebody you don't know, because the community itself is where we learn. So go ahead, because my throat's dry anyway. Everybody make a new friend? Hopefully everybody got a chance to meet somebody new. So when you do decide to start learning, you have to figure out, okay, you know, I need to learn from you know whoever it is, maybe it's classes or whatever. You have to figure out who's responsible. Who's responsible for your learning? I don't know if it, does everybody know what a racy chart is? A racy chart? What? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so a racy chart is is basically this grid. It's a matrix of tasks and who's responsible for them. Uh, it stands for RACI: Responsible, Accountable, Consulted, and Informed. So a lot of project managers will use this when they're doing projects. And it basically is something that you have to determine what the tasks are that uh, are needed to do a certain job, in this case learning, and who are the people that are responsible, accountable, consulted, or informed about those tasks. So as an example, making the time to learn. You're responsible and accountable for making the time to learn. Pretty self-explanatory, right? But maybe your peers' mentors might be consulted as far as how much time to learn. You're learning Python. About how long should you take to learn Python? You know, your boss and your family and friends may be informed. Hey, I'm starting to learn something. I'm not going to be as available as I was before. Um, but you know, making t uh, money for learning, lab resources, peers and mentors, things like that, transferring knowledge. This all kind of gives you the idea of. I may have gotten one or two of these wrong, but uh, basically, who's responsible for doing that task, and then who's accountable for having it done? And if somebody's consulted or informed, it gives you an idea of who's responsible for your learning, and ultimately, ultimately, it's you. 
And I'm not immune to it either. I mean, I have lots of things I like to do. I love music. I love. I don't play very well. Uh, I love learning languages. I love reading. I love all kinds of different learning. But I don't make enough time for it, and that's 100% my fault. So if you know, if you decide I want to learn something, whatever it may be, you need to carve out the time to do so. So now that we know a little bit about how to learn, we want to make sure we don't burn out on it. And a lot of people have talked about burnout before, and I thought I had it at one point. The more I've dug into this is the more I've realized that I probably was just stressed out. So kind of to understand how you know if you have it, uh, Wikipedia defines burnout as a psychological term that refers to long-term exhaustion and diminished interest in work, which is kind of a wishy-washy definition of it as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's also, and this is interesting to note, burnout is not a recognized disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, but it is recognized by the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, specifically as a state of vital exhaustion. So basically, this is one of the reasons that it leads to a debate, does it exist or not? There's opposing viewpoints on this. Uh, Bill Brenner wrote an art, a couple articles actually recently uh, regarding how the burnout has affected the community and how there have been problems with people dying and you know, getting in real trouble basically from it. And you know, I agree with him on a, a number of the, the views as far as this is, if it, it does to get to that point, that person needs help, we need to get them the help that they need. And it's if it's something where you feel that you're in that situation, talk to somebody because the community, again, needs to be there for everybody. Uh, Cryptia had a little bit different uh, take on it. He said, where's the research? We haven't done any research in this community, per se, uh, like a statistical research on it, to try and determine if it's a real thing and if it's more prevalent in this industry than it is in others. Um, his ideas, though, say basically that complaining about it won't solve it and that we're supposed to be, as security person, uh, professionals, we're the canary in the coal mine. We're the ones that we let the business know that, hey, we've got this issue. The business signs off on it. That's all you can do. A lot of times, because we care, though, you end up that it affects you personally. You want things to be secure because you're a security professional. And when the business says, no, we accept this risk and signs off on it, you feel almost like it's an affront to you. And he's saying, well, no, you, you just got to let it go and move on. And that, I think that's a, a big struggle for the, the community as a whole is, is that people do care. And it is hard for them to, to let go. Um, ironically, though, Lee Munson, uh, who's a person out of Ireland, I believe, um, wrote an article on uh, bhconsulting.ie about how security professionals don't have the stress that other IT areas do. He read an article about stress in the IT organization as a whole and said, you know, a bunch of people in IT said, yeah, we're really stressed. Yeah, it's really a, a difficult job. But then when he reached out on Twitter and says, do you feel stressed? He got an overwhelming response back from the security community on Twitter saying, no, we're not stressed. We enjoy our work. We like what we're doing. We feel like we work with smart people. We feel like we're, you know, making a difference and they're not stressed. Yeah, I agree. I think each, each of the different viewpoints has valid points that they bring up. Uh, I do think that the community does need to help people that feel burned out. I think that the community needs to be there for people that need help. Um, I do agree, that, like Jack says, though, that we do need more research. And it could be that there's differences between us and Europe. Europe does a lot of things different than we do. So it could be that because they have less stress over there for, you know, they got more vacation, they have, you know, different health care, whatever it may be, you know, whatever the reasons are, we have to, you know, basically do those studies and figure out why. Maybe it's something we need to change on our side of the pond. So my particular viewpoint is, is that, like I mentioned earlier, is a lot of people are security for their company. 
And they're supposed to be secu all manners of security for their company, regardless of what it is. So you're supposed to understand, you know, the physical aspect and do all the badge scanner stuff. You're supposed to understand the web apps uh, and be able to secure those. You're supposed to under understand the ID administration side of it. There's so many different things to know. You can't be an expert in everything. But overall, I think that for burnout, we do need to deal with it on our own. It's something that, you know, you need to understand what makes you feel stressed and what helps you. Um, people can suggest, you know, different things to help. They can say, you know, you can't know everything, find something that makes you happy. You know, it's a job, it's not saving lives well, most of the time, but sometimes it is. Um, you, you know, you need to unplug, things like that, but you're the one that has to deal with the burnout or the being stressed out, and you're the one that has to understand what works for you and what doesn't. You know, but if you do get to that point that you say, I've tried what I can do and I need help, definitely reach out, or if you see someone that you think is having that issue, reach out to that person and say, hey, you know, are you doing okay? Is everything all right? Anything I can do to help you? So when I was doing the research for this talk and I tried to figure out, you know, stressed out or burned out, when I first started learning about burnout, I thought I was burned out. I'm like, I hate my job and, you know, this, that, and other thing. So I'm like, I must be burned out. The big thing between the two, though, is do you actually care? If your boss is yelling at you, if you missed a deadline, if, you know, someone's hacking your network, whatever it may be, do you care? Is it something where you've reached the point that you literally are depressed and don't give a flying rat's rear end? That's kind of the differentiation between the two. Um, and I, part of this, when we, I was doing the research on it, was when my girlfriend and I were talking about what she's seen over in uh, Vancouver, Canada, is, you know, when she's seen someone get burned out on their jobs, they make a lot of mistakes. They don't get along with their peers. They feel like nobody understands them and they're exhausted. Learning and anything else basically becomes a chore. So if it's something where you're really passionate about something and then all of a sudden you know, you're, at work, you're at work and you're doing it, but then you get to the point you don't want to know anything else, you don't want to learn anything new, you might be reaching the past stressed out point to burnout. And the other thing I wanted to bring up is the imposter syndrome. And I suffer from this pretty, pretty bad. Um, basically, it's a psychological phenomenon in which people are unable to internalize their accomplishments. I don't take praise well at all. When somebody says, oh, you did a great job on something, I'm like, oh, okay. And I try and like downplay it and move on. Imposter syndrome comes from the ability to not think that you're good at what you do. And the only way that I've been able to deal with it basically is to try and understand that I am good at some things. I'm good at vulnerability management. I'm not good at pen testing. I can make those determinations between the two now, and that helps out a little bit for me anyway. So if you guys can take one thing from this talk, this is the one slide I want you to internalize. Everyone can teach you something. Be humble enough to learn. Um, so if you look at the, the two different types of talks there, a lot of people want to go to the one on the left. You know, that's usually the new, you know, vulnerability that's being released or, you know, hey, I'm going to show you how to do this live on stage. A lot of people want to go to those talks because they're the, the, the new hotness or whatever. A lot of the talks on the right, though, are just as important. The people in the room don't make the difference. It's the people that are in the room that want to learn make the difference. So hopefully you've learned something from me today. Any questions? Thanks.